I expect some people clicking this video will think it's about isolating yourself from COVID, but it's not. It's about something bigger. COVID is one aspect of what's going on outside your home. This is a message for everyone who thinks they can isolate or protect themselves from other, even bigger social problems indefinitely. As a result, I'm mostly addressing a certain class of people. People who might consider themselves middle class, who own things like houses and cars, who get the middle to upper management positions and expect to live off a pension or a rental property. I can't predict the future. But I think if people in that class continue to downplay what's going on around them in society, they're in for a rude awakening. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. First, though, big thanks to all our sponsors. Quibi, Cozy, Mooby, Tubi, Adobe, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Those last three have been sending me these gold coins they say they just found lying around somewhere? Having grown up with that sheltered suburban life, my goal was always supposed to be the same as all the adults around me. Find a place in the suburbs, have a family, obviously, and try to make enough money to remain isolated from the effects of social problems. Sure, there's violence, racism, people living in the streets, but if I have a good enough security system and nice high fences, I won't have to be affected by it. Sure, the planet is heating up, but as long as I have my air conditioner and enough money to live the rest of my life indoors, what's the problem? And I would think that these these this was exactly what these comfortable suburban folks believed, except I don't think they've thought it through. The people I grew up around still live in nice houses and suburbs, and they're doing pretty well. They still don't feel the threats of climate change, maybe because they think they can buy their way out of it. Because money can solve every problem, right? And technology can solve climate change, right? What's the latest idea? Dimming the sun? Yeah, not everything The Simpsons did is worth doing in real life. Anything to avoid changing the system, which protects the profits of corporations, but also the assets, meager as they might be, of the middle class. Actually, I don't like the term middle class. I'm going to say the PMC, or professional managerial class, to be more accurate. Along with their investments and their pensions, the PMC is psychologically fully invested in this system and completely dependent on the status quo. They might say, Black Lives Matter, but if things get too shaken up, like if people actually do what's necessary to protect black lives, which might mean arming themselves or doing something illegal, the PMC will become just as conservative as the wealthy people who sign their checks. I'm speaking very generally when I talk about class, of course. Words tend to simplify more complicated things. If what I say doesn't apply to you, there's no need to take it personally. I'm talking about general tendencies. Classes usually refer to people with a similar position in the system, and that's why they have more or less money and power. Classes have certain interests and attitudes in common. But just being in one class or another doesn't make any of your behavior inevitable, just easier to understand. The PMC in North America is not all white, even though everyone I grew up around was. But if they come from a different culture, they'll struggle to maintain it beyond superficial expression like wearing traditional clothes at annual celebrations of multiculturalism. People of color in the professional managerial class, POC in the PMC, need to assimilate into the culture of whiteness. That means everything from speaking English fluently to adopting more conservative political views. 
The upshot of this pursuit of wealth and comfort, this hiding in the suburbs and putting fingers in one's ears, makes the violence of the system that rules us invisible. And of course, that's why a lot of people do it in the first place. I don't begrudge wanting to be safer, but from their relatively safe and free communities, they spread self-serving ideology that tells them things just aren't quite as bad as the protesters say it is. No need to be so rash. The system will fix itself. The bad people will go to jail. If you refuse to acknowledge the violence other people go through, you will never understand the system or why so many people hate it. So it's hard to say this group, this class, has any principles at all. Individually they might, of course, but as a group they believe in nothing. They live their lives the only way they know, they question nothing, they accept and promote exclusionary thinking, like hating on immigrants, criminals, and the poor, and downplaying their suffering. So of course the PMC believes in borders and parrots the nonsense about there's no room in our country. Of course they say the world is overpopulated. The lives of poor people don't matter to them, as long as the wheels continue to turn somehow. But is it really the, the world's poor who are causing the problems? You wouldn't say it's the rich? The rich not only have all the money and power and thus create poor people, but individually emit 60 times the carbon that poor people do. The links are in the description. And actually it's worse than that because that's just the richest 10% compared to the poorest 10%. The one billion poorest people produce less carbon in a lifetime than one passenger on an 11 minute flight to space. If the earth is overpopulated, we know who it is who has to go. One way to explain this mindset is the PMC value institutions for the sake of institutions, not because of what they actually do. For example, they believe the law in itself is good, inherently legitimate, whatever its effects are. I was pointing out some people are now getting rich off the legalization of cannabis, while there are still thousands or, I don't know, millions maybe, of people locked up for selling it. I said they should be let out of prison now that it's legal, and my interlocutor said, but they broke the law when it was the law. I mean, these are people who care so little about the lives and freedom of other people, they will defend keeping people in prison for years for things we've all agreed are okay, actually. Another way to give you insight into this culture is to say recycling is more important than liberation to the PMC. More important than black lives, more important than animal lives, and more important than kids in cages at the border. And we know that because they won't lift a finger to free the kids, but they'll report their neighbors for not recycling. In fact, most of them say nothing about the genocides, and I don't use that word lightly, committed by their supposed countries, and it's because they're indifferent. Recycling is just plugging a hole in the dike. At some point in our lives, we'll be forced to change our consumption patterns, no matter how much you've been recycling. The environment just can't take it much longer. But really comfortable people will do anything to avoid facing a disturbing truth, including supporting violence against nonviolent people. They want activists to be civil, which means quiet. And if they're not constantly civil, they lose the PMC's support. Asking oppressed people for civility is like asking someone to be calm while you're pointing a gun at them. Telling them you'll only listen if they follow your standards of politeness in all settings is just an excuse to ignore them. We're being killed! Please don't raise your voice or I'll call the police. Members of the PMC tend to valorize the civil disobedience of the past, like the suffragettes or MLK. But if someone blocks the road now, to bring attention to life-or-death struggles, they're a nuisance. 
They block roads to show people how it feels to be powerless. And the fact is, if they didn't get in your face, you wouldn't even hear about them or their cause. For years during the First Intifada, Palestinians tried non-violent means to get Israel to end its occupation. And they still do, every day. They got no concessions from Israel at all. Then they started throwing stones and Molotov cocktails, and suddenly they were getting international recognition, and the word intifada came into common use. Sure, some people started calling Palestinians terrorists, but you can be sure they weren't supporting Palestinians before that anyway. But at least they started receiving sympathy from people who realized if Palestinians are so desperate they'll throw rocks at a tank, something is wrong. So if you're inconvenienced or turned off because people are taking back their freedom in a way you happen to disagree with, ask who told you the correct way to protest and why. Ask why other people standing up for themselves makes you nervous. Some people have an endless supply of excuses for why nothing should change. The system works. Have you tried all the legal channels? Uh, why don't you run for office yourself? You're just unwilling to compromise. Yes, people should not have to compromise on their freedom and their lives. Oppressed people get told to compromise every time they raise their voices. Why don't you try it for a change? There's always an excuse to delay addressing someone's claim or just reject it outright. I don't care if the PMC considers the demands of oppressed people excessive or unreasonable. Some people want justice, others want quiet. They are not the same. Oh, and for the record, they're not offended. They're being killed. Then there's the blame on both sides. How many times have you heard someone say that and then sit back as if they've pro solved the problem in the wise way. There is blame on both sides. I am the enlightened center. Both sides are bad is not the right take when oppressed people are fighting their oppressors. You might not agree with all their methods, but liberation doesn't come through peaceful, convenient means. Unless you've played some role in helping them further their cause without violence, in which case you know how frustrating it is, telling people how they're allowed to free themselves is to support their continued oppression. Likewise, people disavow the past, like saying the genocide and slavery this country was built on are bad, but they don't seem to realize the systems created by those massive crimes against humanity are still in place still privileging one class over another, still oppressing and killing the same people, and still giving you excuses for why it's all justified. To oppose current protests against a system built on genocide and slavery is to support the conditions they're fighting against. To support this system because you have never questioned it. Some people are too scared of what they might have to give up if they learn to question. It's always a matter of what's in it for me? If it's not issues that affect white people with money, they don't care. They want the monetary rewards of their jobs and the psychic rewards of propaganda, which tells them this is the greatest system slash country in the world and everyone is lucky to be here. They will protect their precious brains from evil outside thoughts. Anyone challenging either of these things, their money or the propaganda, must be wrong. We're already seeing a, a rise in nationalism in North America, Europe, and Asia. You know, where all the money goes, but the people aren't allowed to. And it's going to continue as climate change ramps up. History teaches us white supremacist gangs will ally with the state to use violence on anyone who protests the status quo. When you hear calls for civility, you know well-meaning liberals have unthinkingly allied themselves with the right. It's convenient to believe in the both sides are bad fallacy. People expect me to be a nationalist and believe all this nonsense too, just like most of the PMC because I'm a white guy who grew up in Canada, 
with all the privileges that entails. Let me explain why my conscience would never permit me to be a nationalist. Imagine you're a child, and you live in a nice home with two parents and two older brothers. You are the apple of your parents' eye. You don't have to lift a finger around the house, you get praise for doing the minimum, and you want for nothing. Your brothers, however, are a different story. Your parents make them do all the housework. They don't feed your brothers as well as they feed you. Their bedroom isn't as nice as yours. It was, but when you were born, your brothers got crammed into the smallest room, which doesn't even have heating. Your parents keep buying you presents, and soon your room fills up, so your parents start putting your things in your brother's room, so their space keeps getting smaller. One of your brothers has to do extra work, but sometimes when he does, he gets extra food, so occasionally he can eat as well as you do. He mostly gets ignored. Your oldest brother, on the other hand, gets beaten up by your dad every day. Sometimes you ask if all this is fair, but your parents just keep repeating that everyone in this house has the same opportunities to avoid work and punishment, and the only reason your brothers have it worse is they don't work as hard as you. You don't remember working hard, but your parents tell you the same thing every day, so you don't know any better. They also insist every time you ask that yours is the best family in the world. Sure, we have our problems, but things are like that everywhere, just worse. So you shouldn't resent your parents for anything they do to you, because things could always be worse. What your parents want is for you to be an accomplice in this whole arrangement. But one day, you start questioning. Questioning the necessity of making your brothers work so hard. Questioning the daily beatings. You soon realize things don't have to be this way, regardless of what they're like elsewhere. You realize what your parents have been doing to your brothers. Do you still respect them? Do you continue to love and trust them just because they gave birth to you? What if your brothers wanted to get free? Would you help them? Would you go with them? Or would you go in your room and put your fingers in your ears? It seems to me a lot of people in North America and Europe are doing just that, pretending the good life is fair and will go on forever, ignoring the violence going on in the next room because it would force them to confront their complicity in it. What these people don't understand is there are others who want their emancipation from this system. They want to be free of it. They're tired of your reassurances that anyone can get rich if they just work hard. They are done buying this bullshit. Just because you've succeeded by the system's own standards doesn't mean the system is worth keeping around. When you start to realize why people are so angry, you might also understand why you can't keep a lid on popular resentment forever. Let's look at just a few of the things people are mad at. For years, people have been demonstrating for black lives. Why? Because the law, the police, prisons, courts, prosecutors, the whole so-called justice system is inclined to give black people a worse deal, which means compared to relatively wealthy, relatively white people, there's more chance they'll be poor. There's more chance they'll get arrested, mainly since police go to poor black and brown neighborhoods looking for people to arrest. There's way more chance they'll get prosecuted, way more chance they'll get killed. I'll put some links in the description, but it's easy to Google if you don't believe me. Statistics on racial disparities are some possible keywords. You might also find it's not just black people, but the darker one's skin, the more likely they are to be targeted by a colonizer state like the US or Canada. In fact, it's not just there, it's everywhere. Even in Egypt, I met refugees from the rest of Africa who had it even worse than Egyptians. And that's saying something. Of course, you don't have to suffer racial disparities to be angry. You might just get shit on for being gay, being trans, being disabled, being autistic. People will discriminate against you for any appearance of non-conformity to an arbitrary ideal. 
And when I say you get shit on, I mean you're more likely to be poor, arrested, beaten up, and killed than people who fit in. Instead of accepting the diversity that is the inevitable byproduct of freedom, the rise of black and queer voices has led to a violent reaction. White supremacists have been growing in number and getting bolder, engaging in mass shootings of people of color or LGBTQ people. If you watch the news, you've heard about mass shootings, although you might not have heard the bigoted motivations for most of them. The people I grew up around, the see-no-evil types, many of them or their kids are ripe for joining the right wing. It's pretty much the logical extension of what the PMC believes anyway. Things are fine the way they are, so conform to the system and culture or face violence. Now anti-fascists are mobilizing in response. Along with all kinds of other essential community building, anti-fascists meet the threat of white supremacists, but get way harsher treatment by colonial court systems. It's not surprising. The system is based on white supremacy. Fighting one means fighting the other. Here's an issue I wish more people were talking about. War. The Pentagon does not keep rigorous statistics about how many it has killed, but Brown University does and its count of the direct war dead in the U.S.'s imperialist war since 9-11 total over 800,000. That is direct deaths by the U.S. military. It doesn't include the greater numbers injured or made refugees, or who've died indirectly as the result of the bombing of infrastructure. One estimate finds these wars have displaced 37 million people. The right wing has used the inflow of refugees, especially in Europe, to throw up its hot takes about how white people are getting replaced and our civilization is under attack. But actually, accepting refugees would be the first step in acknowledging one's responsibility for creating them. You don't have to take from poor people to house refugees. We can find the space. How about this? Let's take everyone who got rich off these wars throw them out of their homes, and let refugees live there. What could be fairer? And if you don't care enough about any of the killing and all the other horrible things war is made of to try to stop the wars, think of yourself. You're paying for it. If you're in the so-called middle class or working class too, you pay most of the taxes. We're talking about trillions of dollars going toward war. Mass murder costs you trillions of dollars, while the number of people living in the streets keeps climbing. What part of this is acceptable to you? And if you want to talk about climate change, just remember the people hit hardest by it will be the same people hit hardest by every crisis. Racialized people, LGBTQ people, poor people, disabled people. The only legal ways of doing anything about any of these problems are voting to no effect and protests that are easy to ignore. Otherwise, you're supposed to shut up and go back to work. There are no legal ways to make things better. They've been tried, and they've been proven only to serve the powers that be, the folks who got rich creating all these problems. How much longer do people have to wait for justice and freedom? How many kids in cages is too many before you question the violence of borders? How many workers need to work themselves to death before you question jobs? How many more people need to get publicly executed to make you reconsider the police? The only thing I can infer when people make excuses for these things is they approve of them. So don't be surprised when you see dead cops and burning buildings and riots and looting. Don't pretend you have no idea how people could be so angry or they're just brainwashed. Peaceful methods have been exhausted and have brought no results. I know how these very comfortable people think. No civilian violence against the state or property or corporations is ever justified, even in self-defense. And most or all police violence, while it may occasionally be excessive, is justified and good and nothing to get upset about. And if you just assume something's bad because it's illegal, 
and something good because it's legal, you have a child's understanding of right and wrong. The usual response to people demanding change is state violence. The PMC might decry violence in the abstract, but they approve of virtually every incident of police violence. And it's always the fault of the people protesting. They shouldn't have protested so loud. The police had no choice but to gas them and beat them and arrest them and strip search them. I don't even know why they were protesting, but if they inconvenience me slightly, they lose my sympathy. Which was fake anyway. It's, it's part of the demand that everything fit into one's worldview. But it's okay to expand your mind to incorporate a new sense of solidarity. So maybe the answer is to stop voting conservative and start voting liberal, right? No. There are no political parties that will solve this problem, or these problems, let's say. The system will not accommodate solutions. Solutions would diminish its power. Here's my impression of all pseudo-left parties every day, like the Democrats or Labour or the NDP. See, we wanted to use our power for good, but the mean other party wouldn't let us. Sure, we have just as much power as them, and used to have more, but if you give us more power in the next election, we promise to do the things we've never done before. Likewise, you can make all the personal changes you want, but they are not solutions to systemic problems. It doesn't matter if you're kind or well-intentioned, if you give money to charity, if you vote for the fake left, because none of these things will change the system. If we do nothing, things will continue to get more violent and oppressive. Social problems will proliferate. Numbers of homeless people, foreign refugees, people dead from state violence or white supremacist violence or, or another virus, because let's not pretend COVID is the only one we'll have to deal with in our lives, will rise over our lifetimes. You could play a role in making things better. It might mean it might bring more meaning to your life than chasing money and trying to manage your bubble. You could actively support the struggle against white supremacy. You could support unions trying to make more than the bare minimum. You can stand in unconditional solidarity with oppressed people around the world. You can stop using sweeping excuses like both sides. Or you can hunker down and wait for the storm. Thanks for watching. Here are some of the topics I didn't get round to covering this week.